reflections from a lifetime of trying to fit in. Every new school year started with an important ritual for us. After buying the notebooks and textbooks, my sister and I would sit for hours covering these books with a binding paper. The most crucial part of this process was the name slip that was stuck on every book. These name slips had to be carefully chosen as it stayed with one through the whole year and was at the center of the many judgments that students made of each other. So efforts had to be made to select one that conveyed how cool you are. Though the name slip contained only one's identification markers like your name, your school, your section and subject, I cannot help but wonder if this marked the beginning of a lifelong process of addressing oneself through these markers. I was four when this started. I'm 21 now. Confirm. Everything I have encountered in life, from college applications to social media profile, demands me to fit into a narrative, a story, a string of words that is palatable to the listener, always presenting a truth that is the most acceptable. So we define ourselves in terms of all the markers we are born with, our name, caste, religion, state, nationality, most of which we had no control over, but have somehow become the most telling of who we are as people. These identities, which I have held in contempt for a long time, they matter. They, I have been told, help us know our place. So here I am, Shivakami Prasanna, a product of an intercast love marriage in urban Kerala in India within these 13 words is enough privilege to ensure that I receive education and would be allowed some freedom in my decisions. These identities offer a roadmap for life. They decide our education, our partners, our desires, spaces we occupy, the friendships we have and more. Belonging here is easy and difficult at the same time. Easy because our spaces have been well defined from the moment we are born. We only need to occupy it. Difficult because what if we don't belong here? What if a few of us realize that we aren't connected to any of these identities, that these markers, they tell us absolutely nothing about ourselves. As I said before, this I is an I made palatable and acceptable to the viewers. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. Some of us exist at the peripheries, between the borders of these identities, trying to belong, but also not wanting to belong at the same time. And there's an ocean's difference between the I one is and the I one has to be. And the world's most admirable fallacy, it lies in convincing all of us that we belong here. Questioning. The power of confirmation is seductive. Transgression, on the other hand, is difficult and stigmatized. However, the stories of transgressions are even more wonderful than those of confirmation. Perhaps the story of Ketaki and Shiva would make this clearer. A word of caution, there are many versions out there. This one is constructed completely from my memory and colored by my biases. So the story goes on like this. Once Lord Vishnu and Lord Brahma flew into a range over the question of supremacy. The intensity of their anger made the anxious devas rush to Lord Shiva for help. At the request of his devotees, Lord Shiva proceeded to the battlefield. He sent Brahma and Vishnu a test to find out who was greater. There, in the midst of the battlefield, Lord Shiva assumed the form of a huge pillar of light. The test was to find the ends and beginning of Shiva's power. Both Brahma and Vishnu were awestruck by the cosmic pillar of light, but without a moment's hesitation, each set out to complete the task. Vishnu took the avatar of a boat and started digging into the depths of earth and heavens, while Brahma took the form of a swan and flew upwards in search of the beginning. After weeks of trying, Vishnu finally admitted defeat. While Brahma continued his journey upwards, the impossibility of the task soon dawned on him too. But as fate would have it, he saw a Ketaki flower wafting down slowly. Brahma knew that Ketaki was one of Shiva's favorite flowers and used in the worship of the Linga. He stopped the flower and inquired where she had come from. The naive Ketaki replied that she had been placed at the top of the pillar of the light. Convinced of his inability to complete the task, but ruled by his ego, Brahma asked Ketaki for help. He pleaded and jostled and finally convinced poor Ketaki to bear false witness to the claim that Brahma had reached the top of the pillar. However, when Lord Brahma claimed victory, it took only a moment for Shiva to see through the light. Brahma was punished with a curse that prevented him from being worshipped on earth. And poor Ketaki, she was cursed and forbidden from ever being used in the worship of Shiva. In most narratives, this is the story about Brahma. Very few attach importance to the plight of Ketaki, whose only fault was moving away from where she rightfully belonged. Nowhere in these stories is the purpose behind Ketaki's fall mentioned. I would like to believe that Ketaki had finally made the decision to move out of her holy abode for whatever her reasons were. But on the way of doing so, the poor thing got caught between these arrogant gods. 
Ketiki lamented her fate and wondered, would it have been better to stay put, to not have left at all? Breaking free. Mythology's beauty lies in its openness to interpretation. To me, this is a wonderful story because of the point it makes. The place you're born into might not always be where you're destined to be. Sometimes, no matter how great the repercussions, wanting to leave is reason enough for leaving. The Ketiki flower continues to dot our gardens in its grand splendor, probably proud of the decision she has made and the answers she has found. For me, that's what belongingness has always been about. The roots of where you've come from, they don't have complete control over where you end up. We start somewhere, we adapt, we confirm, try to survive until we reach a point where we decide that we're done pretending. Over the years, the many alternative universes that I have built for myself to feel at home had often tumbled down under practical conditionalities. Every time this happens, I remind myself of a phrase that I found in Anita Nair's mistress, the plank of avidity. It referred to a plank on a boat whose height was raised with every new challenge the sea brought. To me, the plank of avidity represents the grandiosity of all life has to offer and the need to constantly raise one's expectations, desires and dreams with every step one takes. The phrase has quashed the repressive notion of defining myself in a few words or in a few sentences. I am a sum of everything that has happened to me, of every book I've read and every friend I've met, of every place I have called home and every moment I have lost myself in. At every turn, this phrase reminds me that the world is a wish granting factory for anyone who is ready to make their journey remarkable. Thank you.